I think the pain is a fascinating phenomenon. You know, it's just so amazing. And regardless how many researchers we have, our work. You're listening to In Your Pants with Dr. Susie G, a physiotherapist for your private, helping you get in the know down below. Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of the In Your Pants podcast, where we have candid conversations with experts about sex, pelvic pain, and everything in between. Today, I've got guest Di Wu talking about his journey from being a surgeon in China to becoming a pelvic physiotherapist in Montreal, Canada. We talk openly about his personal experience as a Chinese man and how his sexuality, upbringing, culture, and education have shaped his practice and fuel his desire to work with men who have pelvic health and sexual health concerns. We dive into his clinical research on spinal conditions and how these conditions connect with the pelvic floor, particularly with pelvic pain, urinary issues, and sexual dysfunction. So before we dive into the details of this interview, let me formally introduce our guest who has quite an impressive bio. Ji Wu, also known as Woody, is originally from China. In 2004, he obtained his medical degree at the China Medical University. After graduating, he completed his postgraduate training in orthopedic surgery at Beijing Chia Chen Hospital. Then, returning to his hometown, he worked as an attending orthopedic surgeon at Fuxin Central Hospital from 2007 to 2010. During that time, he cared for trauma and spine injuries, seeing and treating thousands of people. After coming to Canada, he attended McGill University for a master's in physical therapy in 2011. This learning perspective deepened his expertise in managing musculoskeletal conditions and gave him another perspective of how to treat disorders of the musculoskeletal system. He is now able to offer multiple approaches to help patients eliminate pain and heal from injury that go beyond a surgical approach and rely upon the body's incredible capacity to heal. Dee is now a physical therapist and director of the V-Active Clinic, where he provides services for a wide diversity of health conditions, including musculoskeletal disorders, male pelvic-related issues, vestibular problems, chronic disease management, and sports injuries. Combining his strong background of medicine and rehabilitation, D can review a vast body of knowledge to find the best treatment options for his patients. Having developed a strong interest in the link between lumbar spine conditions and pelvic pain syndrome, D innovatively used mechanical diagnosis and therapy as a screening tool to rule out spinal sources of pelvic pain and dysfunction. He has described this approach in a case study which was published in the journal Physiotherapy, Theory, and Practice. Outside of the clinic, Dee also is a physical health educator and promoter. He has been an invited speaker at several international conferences in Canada, U.S., and China. Dee is currently involved in the promotion of modern physiotherapeutic strategies in China. He is a founding member of the Ma- Major International Rehabilitation Education and Neo Sino Canadian Health organizations that are dedicated to bringing new clinical concepts to clinicians in China. In his spare time, Dee enjoys traveling, photography, cooking, yoga, martial arts, and spending time outdoors. He is proud to work with such a fantastic team of clinicians. So without further ado, I introduce to you Woody. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, Woody. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Hi, Susie. Thanks for having me here. I'm very excited. (laughs) Me too. I think the topics that we're going to be talking about are going to hit home with a lot of people, a lot of the audience. And before we get to the the juicy details, though, I want to ask or I want the listeners to know about your journey and how you became a pelvic health physiotherapist. Wow, Uh, that's a quite long journey, I would say, for me to find my path. Um, About 10 years ago, I came to Canada from China. So where I worked as an orthopedic surgeon uh, for about three years. So I did all my medical training and the residency and then started practice 
uh, as a surgeon. So that was my dream at that moment. And um, then for whatever the reason, I want to uh, look outside of the box. I will stay, you know, so I want to see what's going on outside. So I made my decision to uh, come to Canada. So when I came to Canada, you know, it's very hard as a new immigrant. You have to restart everything. Uh, so I decided to went to McGill and to do a master in physiotherapy. So I, I, for me, that was a way, you know, to get into the system and to start a practice at least in the health system to, you know, just keep me uh, still in the in the uh, in the practice. But when I started you know, uh, physiotherapy. So I just, you know, fall in love with what I, I was told. So, wow, that is so much more we can do, you know, other than surgery. So, you know, and there are so many things you can do actually prevent surgery. So I, that's something, uh, you know, really amazed me. So I remember like when I practiced surgery, like, uh, in several rotations, like sometimes I just feel there's a link between, you know, the pelvis and uh, other musculoskeletal conditions, you know, mm -hmm. and there's always this question, no one can answer me, you know, uh, in the practice, because we all stay in our own uh, practice, you know, orthopedic surgeon right. do musculoskeletal and the urology do your genital part. So, mm -hmm. and we don't really have a lot of communication you know per se you know where you practice so then there was a chance at McGill for the first time they provide this pelvic floor physiotherapy course mm. I said oh, wow that's something maybe is uh, you know can can answer my question so um, then I took the course with uh, I would say about 13 other girls there's no guy in the class and it's a very awkward yeah. situation, you know. It's so common. Uh, yeah, it's like right. you're the gem. You're the rare gem in that class. <laughs> and we have to practice uh, many practical skills on each other. Anyway, so that went well. Uh, so well, after I graduate, I, like I just feel this is so amazing. You know, there's, oh, there's so many things I never learned in the medical school, you know. Mm. And so after that, I still trying to, doing my equivalency, but at one point I finished my, all my examination and then I say, is it worth to go back to do what I used to do, you know? I enjoyed what I'm doing so much and, um, and I see there is a need uh, as a male therapist to practice in uh, pelvic health, especially in men's health. There needs someone to speak for men and to understand men, you know? Uh, so that's why I made decision, you know, this is my main passion right now. This is my path. And so here I am right now. I'm practice, you know, <laughs> as a health health therapist rather than, you know, also big surgeon. So long journey. And such an amazing journey. I, I'm, I'm so glad that you shared that with us because it provides that insight of to, you know, we you usually think that just because someone is a surgeon or a doctor that they know everything. And it and it sounds like you're like you're so amazed to learn about this mysterious part of our body called the pelvis that you didn't really get that education in school. Um, yeah. And then you decided to say, you know what? I did, I, there's much more to um, helping people than just doing surgery, which I, you know, there's, there's a time and a place for sur surgical intervention. Of course, we don't want to discount that. Um, but it's just the beauty that you've recognized, like, you know, I don't know. And made the decision to say, you know, I don't know if I want to go back to that. I think I can, I can do more and help people more without the surgical interventions. And you, you're just making the choice to, to do something else and then getting into pelvic health and being a male and working with men and pelvic health concerns. I mean, again, very rare and so needed in, in our world today. Right. Yeah. I think, uh, and that's what I feel, you know, I feel uh, in the society, like the men always have this image is so strong, you know, and beatable, you know, but actually we are very vulnerable. And uh, 
if you look at all the clinical work, research work has, you know, have been done in the past, mainly focused on female pelvic health, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is really something has been overlooked, I would say, by almost all health professionals. You know, we we'll barely mm -hmm. ask a man how they feel. So, and right now, especially right now, you know, the high stress level in the society and the, the world changing so fast in the environment, everything, you know, there is a huge impact in, on men's health, not only just on pelvic health, in all levels, mental health, physical health, you know, so, uh, and that's what I think I, you know, at the same time, I, you know, I practice to, to serve people, but I didn't, in the meantime, actually it's a healing process for myself, you know, mm -hmm. we all need a therapy. I mean, everyone in our life, we need to find ourselves. And that's, that's, I think that's my journey. I, I, I would happen to, uh, you know, to help these people and move forward and, you know, to share and to empower each other. And I think that's, that's therapy for everyone. Oh, I love that. Empower each other, support one another. I'm also hearing underneath that, I'm, I'm putting these words in here, love one another and have compassion for one another. That's <laughs> right. That's we're, right. We're human. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that yeah. brings me to my next question because you started talking a little bit about it already is, is your own experiences and, and your background, um, being a Chinese man and, and your experiences with sexuality, maybe in sexual health and, and maybe just health in general, but how, how have your lenses, your experiences in your own life shaped and continue to shape your practice? Right. I think it, I, I grew up like, uh, I would say that's the, probably the best period of China. So we, after our, you know, uh, cultural revolution and so, so we started to open up our country. Uh, so I was born in 1981. So that's very long ago. And when I was a child, you know, I see this change and this change dramatically quickly, you know, uh, so, but you see, like I grew up in a very conservative culture, like a background. So almost talking about sex, this is a, a taboo, you know, and not even you can talk about that. For example, you know, you know, you have a white dream as a young boy. You cannot even talk to your mom and to, you feel shamed. You cannot talk to your, mm -hmm. to your father. And you know, there's something, you know, there. And probably the parents didn't know there's something going on too, you know. No one will address your uh, concerns, fear, and not even, you know, there's not, not existing any sexual education in China mm -hmm. at that moment. So we have this, uh, we call the uh, physiology and hygiene small book like to give to uh, the students. That was in my high school already. So in the high school, you are in teenagers like, you know, so, and just there's a few pages talking about the anatomy of a boy and the anatomy for a girl, you know? So uh, it's very little, you know, they briefly touch about what to expect, the girl hair, pubic hair, your voice change, and a little bit touch about the period menstruation for the girls, but none of them address, oh yes, you know, you start to, probably have sexual contact, you know, what you need to do, what you need to protect. Mm -hmm. And uh, people are freaking out, you know, at one point, because the boys, sometimes they share some information, you know, and some information are very, I mean, how to say, you know, like, like it's underground information, no one wants to expose, and, but you know, there's something going on. So, so that's my background. And then went to medical school. Medical school is, then you have the, you know, you start to learn physiology, function, human function, power function, all of the sexual functions, you start to learn more. But you can still tell, like even medical school teachers, they don't talk about sexual function. No one talk about sexual health. And it seems like this is something that people just don't care. Always become just something natural. Like probably people expect men have erection all the time. Female can have, a, you know, receptive penetration all the time. So 
that's probably you expect in a in a medical school. Like when I start to learn, you know, uh, like this perunia. This is a term like only when you when you start to in this fourth year, fifth year, you start to learn talk about that mm. and uh, the, the diversity of the sexuality. No one talk about that. So that was the year between 1999 to 2004. So that was that time, and then. Uh, I started to do the residency, start to practice, get more and more contact with patient people, and even patient, no one exposed their sexual mm. concerns. But that's something tricky, you know, like when I do operation, sometimes I do feel people have some concern. I have a patient come back, and this young guy, after a, a car accident, and have a femur fracture, you know. Uh, so you see that everything's, you know, very young guy and, uh, you know, the bones are healed very well. Uh, it seems like, you know, walking, there's no issues, right? But you can see from his uh, face and, you know, this is something that doesn't work. And then he's very young and a good profession, you know. So then he said he divorced. And then, then one day he told me, you know, if the thing is, after the femur fracture, uh, it's quite a long, you know, to recover. And actually no one tell him when he should start have sex and what, why there is it safe to have sex. Because we, we told him what movement you can now do. But, you know, right. people did. Yeah. He also have this uh, fear. I, if I move too hard, I'm going to break the implants inside and which has become, and then you can see he's a very unhappy man. Mm -hmm. And, but this is the thing is people, they don't ask and then health profession, they don't know how to give, you know? Yeah. They don't know so, how to ask themselves because they're so uncomfortable <laughs> with their own, with asking the questions, but, but you know, but right. patients expect, you know, people expect their health professionals, you know, I think the statistics are around 40 to 50% in some of the surveys that I've, I've read in the United States and globally, they expect health professionals to bring up topics around sexual health because, you know, you and I both know that sexual health is such an important pillar of, of the health paradigm. It's like you're saying, you know, we, we're comfortable telling people to, you know, get back to walking, strengthen this, get back to function, you know, activities of daily function, but we're forgetting about the most important one, or at least for me, you know, for us, it's like bladder, what? peeing, pooping, yeah. and sex. Those are basic physiological functions, <laughs> and we're not yeah. talking about them, and then people suffer in silence. Right. You know, like when we have, like, that's, when I work as a surgeon, so I work in a trauma department. So that's the most of the thing I deal with. Car accident, hip fractures, spine fractures. And, you know, with bear, like, you, you, you said something right. You know, sometimes we don't even ask how you pee. You know, it's like you have trouble to get into the toilet and they just start to have your sex life. So this is a very big, I mean, taboo even among the health professionals and you can imagine how hard it is you know to for patients to expose themselves mm -hmm. and so when i moved to canada and i think even in our in my mind the western world talk a lot of, about sex you know because all the pornography is coming from united states no so just kidding <laughs> I heard it's from Canada. Wait a second. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So, so that's what we actually you know, tell I just heard something on, I just actually, actually, Woody, I just heard something on the radio on my way here today about Pornhub yeah. actually uh -huh. originating. Oh, like Isn't it Canadian? Yes, it's Canadian. <laughs> right. and, they're, and they're up against a lot of um, scrutiny uh, for some of the content that is or has yeah. been allowed or found. So anyway, I just want to say Canada's not innocent here. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so I expect, you know, here um, people will be more open to that, you know, because I see that. So, but I'm very conservative, you know. <laughs> so I went to the McGill, like, I don't think there's any course that address sexual health. No one talk about that. And then in this pelvic floor course, I think the prof, she's very open-minded, but you can see 
there's still among the students, people are very hesitant, you know, like I have a, I have a friend, you know, and he just come to see, says, you know, I cannot believe, you know, you put your finger there and, you know, even among the students, you know, he said, if I have a power issue, I wouldn't want to have a man, you know, touch me. So you see, already, even in the high education, people are not always feel comfortable or open to this issue. So that's my school journey. And then I practice mm -hmm. uh, as a pelvic health physio, you know, and of course you bring all these ideas in the past and with you. And that's what I said, as I practice, actually it's a, it's a self-healing process for me. You know, there are so many taboos, concerns. And right now I'm just very comfortable talking about it with my patient and we laugh so much, you know, as a lot of time, like I told you, the first time always like I make them laugh. So they say, why, I don't understand my doctor, why send to see a physiotherapist? And I always say, you know, Sex is a contact sport, you know? When you have a sports <laughs> injury, you see a physio. When you have sexual, this is a contact sport, you have to see a physiotherapist. So immediately many people just laugh. And so this is just my, uh, my trick to break the, you know, the silence sometime. So, and, it, and that's all the things like I just learned, actually, I think it's probably you are the same, you know? We learn on our journey, like we, we start to, even when we take, you know, the same education or whatever, mm. but, you know, it's, it's a self-learning experience and I wish we are still learning and it's such an amazing thing, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So Woody, you started talking about your experiences um, treating men. And so for our listeners, uh, tell us about some of the conditions you are treating or who you're working with and you know, how, you're, how you're able to help them. So actually I start to treat women. That's how I start. You know, I start to treat women with urinary incontinence and that's probably the first part of my practice. And that's probably the first year. And then uh, I start to treat men, uh, mostly post prostatectomy. And that's probably, uh, I would say the first condition start to get recognized by medical professionals. So start to refer after surgery, you know? So that's my, I would say the second half of my practice. And then I develop this strong interest to treat men with a pelvic pain syndrome. So which is right now, I would say my patient pelvic patient, 90% are actual pelvic pain, you know? So this is the pay, uh, doctor referrals and also, uh, you know, by other patients. So um, I think the pain is a fascinating phenomenon, you know, it's just so amazing. And regardless how many researchers we have are working hard on it, but we still know just a little about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially when you have a pain in the pelvis and this will interrupt all the other critical functions, for example, urinary function, defecation and sexual function, you know, so this is even more uh, traumatic to the people, you know, because you are not just have a pain, but it just really affect your, your life. You know, this is the life uh, is the basic we need, you know, and it's, you know, link with all our, um, how to say, self-confidence, you know, uh, our emotion, and it's hard to express, and it's hard to find people to help. And so that's, I think, is the amazing and challenging part of to treat men with pelvic pain. Yes, and um, the, the age group is very uh, variable. Like, I, I treat people from, you know, just young adults, 18 years old. Sometimes I have uh, teenagers and coming from uh, the father will accompany, you know, uh, very young group uh, with uh, some like what we so-called like a heart flexor syndrome, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have this middle age group, like say from the 30s to 50s, mainly uh, 
chain and may have urinary dysfunctions and the sexual dysfunctions. And then we have some people come uh, from the age, let's say 50 to 70 or even uh, older, that come for some um, purest want to Im improve their sexual function. I have people come here just have erectile dysfunction and we have very amazing result. Uh, yeah, without any pain and just sexual function. They want to get uh, better to their lives. Sometimes they have second marriage uh, in their 50s and they still want to engage sexual life. Yes. Uh, yes. And there's people like the story I shared in one of your mentorship is is people like sometimes when their wife you know pass away uh mm -hmm. people they don't know what kind of sexual life they can expect and they still want to have a sexual life you know of course it's, well uh, into into our our older years you know and that that's a one misconception and myth that's out there that oh when you're older you, you know you don't have sex anymore. Well, what, at what age does sex not become, is not important anymore? <laughs> I don't know <laughs> because you can be 70, 80, 90 and sex, sex and sexual health and sexuality. And that's still intimacy. That's all still very important. It doesn't matter what age you are. And I feel like there's this such a, you know, and I know I'm guilty of it too. Like I'll see my grandparents or um, older folks and I'll be like, oh, that's really sweet. Look, they're holding hands or they're, <laughs> you know, they're cute. They become cute, but we don't think about them as sexual beings and they're sexual beings. And I just want to put that out there and say, you know, hey folks, doesn't matter how old you are, sex is yeah. still important. And yes, your grandparents, <laughs> If the, you know, they're probably still having sex and being intimate and your parents, right. and I know that's weird to think about, but just know that, that, you know, we're going to be, you know, I, you know, I'm in my thirties. We're going to be, you know, if we live that long, you know, 50, 60, 70, and we're going to ex have those experiences as well. So I think it's bringing it back to our own humanity and recognizing right. that, you know, we're no different. We may look different. Okay, we may be at different times in our lives and different milestones, but we are still human at the core. And those those collective experiences and those feelings we all are, are sharing and are going to share um, at some point or another. Sorry, I just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> that's amazing. You know, that's, you know, sometimes I, I, I sometimes, you know, when the people come in and you feel, wow, they are amazing. They are so engaged. Um, you know, I have, a, I recently have a, a patient, this patient actually, he wrote me a letter and I post on the Facebook, ask, of course, ask for his permission. He wrote such a, a long letter. I was so touching. I think I told him that's the best letter I have read, you know, probably in the past five years. Uh, this old gentleman in his seventies, you know, and, you know, he, let's say it, he's, he has three uh, wives' marriages, but unfortunately, uh, his wife passed away, and he has this testicular pain and also erectile dysfunction. You know, in his seventies, and he still has this need. And I come to see me, and after two sessions, I think three sessions, the testicular pain completely resolved, and also with training, like we we saw each other about three or four times. And also his erectile dysfunction is getting improved a lot. And he wrote me this long letter to express himself, his experience, because he was born in a Catholic background family. Mm -hmm. And he asked me about this masturbation thing. And he said, I was so impressed by you are really open mind to talk about that because at my age, like, in, in my childhood, our teenagers, we just do it quick, quick, and I don't even know this is good or not, you know? So, so I start to use the technique you showed me, actually, the, you know, mindfulness masturbation technique. So I really guide him. And so he improved a lot, amazing. And he writes this long letter, and he tell me why these things work and how our work is so valuable for uh, the community. So I post that letter because it's the month of, we know that November is for mental health. So, 
and people are really encouraged, as I think even in the group. So you see that our job sometimes, you know, we can have a big influence on, you know, uh, individual, but if we all, uh, you know, stay together, we're gonna have an influence on the whole community. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. I, I've heard so much. Well, I mean, that's just how powerful is that? And and for him to say, yes, it's okay to even share that letter because it is important for all of us to recognize the power and the impact that we have as, as clinicians, as people helping other people, you know, that's what I'm hearing. We're, we're people helping other people and we're really helping them during a very challenging time in their life. And they might be grieving the loss of a loved one. They might be grieving loss of function. You know, when you have pelvic yeah. pain, when you have sexual dysfunction, you are, you, you are grieving. There is grief and there's loss, um, for, for, for all of that and the identities and the roles, um, and the connection that we have to ourselves and others. So it's so much deeper than just, oh, symptom management and, you know, a body part. I mean, it's the person who owns the body part and who's living in their body and experiencing the world in such a dynamic and fluid way that I think in, 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 in the traditional medical sense, we forget about that. We forget about that. And then we become very dismissive and cold and, and lack that empathy and compassion that really, that's what people want. You know, you know, I'm struggling and, and I just need your support. And maybe all that is, is just having the space and the safety and the vulnerability um, for them to share their story and be able to express the deep, um, um, grief that they may be experiencing or the frustration or the anger with, about their situation. I think, I think that's, I, th I think that's just really important to just to, to say and name. So. Right. I, I think the problem is, I would say like most health professionals, when you enter medical school or whatever, like physio school, we all have this compassion, you know, we all care, right? But I think the problem is not that is a problem in the system. So right now, you know, the health system is just like, as a doctor, you are overloaded work. You see 50, 60 people a day. And in, the, in that short amount of time, even you have this compassion, you, can, you cannot go that deep. You cannot build a connection. Right. And that's a problem. And then patients have this impression why health professionals become so cold and don't even care. Mm -hmm. But it's actually the system, our, you know, the, it's, it's, it's not, sometimes I tell the patient, it's not individual, it's the health system the problem. We have a problem. And that's become, like we frequently will hear people talk about their primary care physicians, mm -hmm. how short amount of time they don't even listen to them. People complain and they have a reason to complain. Mm -hmm. But I think on the other side, we talk with the doctors, you know, and the, that's the same thing. Doctors are still frustrated too at the same time. Mm -hmm. They have no time to really, you know, engage this kind of connection. They, they cannot. We, in the medical school or physical school, we talk about psychosocial model from the beginning. You know, we always talk about that. But then when you just enter the, the practice, just the pressure and everything makes you just aware, okay, this is a biological, this I have to rule out psychosocial we're going to leave on the side for the health professionals and this is not something right this is need to be changed we are care and especially right now you can tell infections you know uh all of this yeah it's this year this, this is a big issue but in general people are suffering more and more chronic conditions chronic pain obesity uh, you know high blood pressure metabolic issues People are suffering about more chronic issues, and this is there is no medical cure. Doctors that were aware that they can just manage, but it's not cure. So if this is the case, we have to sometimes shift back a little bit to see what we really work with didn't work. You now we may have to take a step back, focus on lifestyle management, focus on prevention. You know this. I think COVID gave us a good lesson on that is we focus too much on the treatment part, not on the prevention and you know, rehabilitation part. So people have already have a low function, are vulnerable to infections. 
but it will still continue for the same way, you know? Right. Keep doing the same thing, expecting for different results, right? It's like, right. Oh not going to happen. Magic and I, pill. I appreciate, yeah, the magic <laughs> pill. Well, and Woody, yeah. I just want to acknowledge, I appreciate you bringing in the other perspective because I think that's, you know, also often not talked about that we're, we're putting the blame on the doctors or something like that, where it's more, it's such a deeper monster, <laughs> maybe not a monster yeah. is not the right term, but it's the system, the machine, the system of which everyone is just trying to do their best within those roles that are really restrictive um, and really um, problematic, as you mentioned. So I appreciate you bringing in that perspective. I think that's important. So Woody, I'd love to switch gears here and talk about the research that you did, um, particularly around the article um, called The Use of Mechanical Diagnoses and Therapy in Patients with Lower Neurotract Tract lower urinary tract symptoms, a case series. And this was done um, with your uh, research counterpart or colleague, Richard Rosdale, correct? Yeah. Awesome. Tell us about this case series and what you, you know, learned from it. I, I think it's really fascinating about spinal conditions and how much um, spinal orthopedic issues can relate to pelvic health issues, particularly urinary tract issues for men, right? This was a, a case series of men. Right. So I, this is really just, I'm, I'm doing this case study, just basically answer my own question. So like I said, in my past practice, I have already see some link between the lumbar spine and the pelvic issues. And the most common we heard is the cauda equina. So this is the thing you learn from medical school, even physio school, the first thing you know, there's a link between the pelvic function and the lumbar spine, the spinal conditions. But in the practice, you know, sometimes we really... Sorry, Woody, yeah. Woody, can you tell our listeners what cauda equina is, just in case people don't know what that is, just kind of a brief description and the connection? Okay, so the cauda equina is a structure, uh, you know, part of the spinal cord. So there's many conditions actually can affect the function of cauda equina. So such as a tumor, fracture, or any, you know, uh, Gene uh, uh, congenital issues. So when they affect the cauda equina, because there's a nerve from there supply the whole pelvis and all these uh, nerves are critical for the proper function of the urinary function, uh, defecation and sexual function. So there will be a influence on this part. So uh, most of the time uh, you will hear, this is a red flag in you know, in, uh, in medical terms. So we need to act quickly. So this is the first uh, condition I said to see, oh, there's a link actually between the lumbar spine. But what about the other minors? And then we do see the other minors. You know, sometimes people have a pain, lower back pain, and people say, you know what? I have pain when I pee. And when I pee, I have my back pain. Mm -hmm. And people will tell you, I have pain during sexual intercourse and the pain is shooting down to my leg. So it's the, you know, so you can start to see, you know, there is what we have learned, the most severe condition, but there's a lot of, you know, in between. So this is the, the question when I always have, when I took my first pelvic health course. So. Uh, when I practice, start practice, I start to, like everyone, take continuing education and courses. And I just uh, get into this mechanical diagnosis and therapy, which is so-called McKenzie method in physiotherapy world. So there is one condition, it's so amazing, fascinating, that's what I say. When you do repeated movement testing, and you have such immediate response in the other part of the body. So for example, we know if there is a pain shooting down to the leg and then while you do spinal repeated movement and then there will be quick change of the pain in the leg. Oh, we know this leg pain coming from the spine. And so this is all about idea. So yes, this can be a tool help me to find, we all know there's a referral pain from the lumbar spine. You know, there's many literature talk about that, but there's no way talk about how to define this. And there's some literature only talk about, oh, you do a flexion, a single flexion, and you do some, you know, this testing measure the length of the spine, 
and you try to define whether there's a spinal issue involved or not. But actually, if you do once, you will not have an idea. But if you do more repeatedly, and then you're going to have ideas. So that's all about, I start to use that in all my patients just to see root out if the pains refer from the lumbar spine. I feel actually they are uh, urinary function, they are influenced by the spine. And the literature support that, you know, we all know intra-abdominal pressure, which is the pressure in the belly, have an impact on lower back pain and bladder function. Uh, right. There's a lot of studies done, but in terms of practice, how we mm -hmm. can find that. So I start to use that in all my patients systematically, and I start to collect the data. Uh, so that's my first theory I published uh, is focused on urinary function. Uh, and right now in my pl clinic, we are actually conducting uh, in, uh, interrater reliability study, which is to see among the five clinicians, we all trained MDT and pelvic health. And we're gonna see if we can reach agreement, for example, to define why the condition, the pelvic pain is coming from the back, or is it coming from local source, or coming from, from other source. So that's the, our second study. So we are right now awesome. in almost the second phase of the data collection. Uh, so hopefully next year, you know, we'll complete the data and we can uh, let the, you know, the public know, yes, there's other, there maybe there's some way to help us to really differentiate what is spine, which is the pelvic. And so how, you know, it's better to guide us for the proper treatment and exercise program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I love that because it sounds like, you know, we, we can't overlook like sometimes in pelvic health physio, some therapists just go straight to the pelvis and, and, you know, not everyone, but we forget about what you're talking about. These repeated movement, like, is this, what is, is there a triggering effect mechanically, um, related from the spine and the nerves coming from the spine that go to the genitals, right? Like, especially the testicles and the top of the pubic bone around the bladder. Um, so many people don't know, or men that have penises and testicles that, um, they have nerves from their back that innervate, that supply these structures and are really important for um, pain, sexual function, uh, bladder and bowel control, et cetera. And in your research uh, paper, the case series, um, you really had some really good success with repeated um, just backbending um, and changing, you know, being mindful of posture. I know there's so much about posture out there, <laughs> what's, yeah. what's good and what's not good. We won't get into that, but postural habits and movement habits and can impact um, tissue health, mobility and tolerance to, right. as you were saying, to various types of demands pressure vectors, et cetera, that can influence these structures over time as well, right? It's not, it's not going to be just the first time or the second time. It's these habits that we find ourselves in because we're creatures of habits that may ultimately kind of lead to like, uh, I'm getting cranky here. <laughs> we need to do something else. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, 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 a, that's right. And I, I the part is like, uh, you know, I have learned many approach and I just found see this thing is to help us to listen to the patient rather than listen to ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. patient do some, something like repeatedly and based on what patient tells you and you can say, oh yes, let's, why not do more than that? You know, just if you, that makes you better, let's do a bit more. So I, I think that's, that's the, the part and I like the most. And the first, you know, I took a lot of courses. And the first person as the instructor I heard, you know, like the, in your course, I said, wow, this, this is amazing. Uh, finally, I, someone can understand us, you know. Uh, I remember you clearly said something. We cannot only focus on the pelvis, the pelvic floor. Actually, pelvic floor for men, most of the time it's just secondary victim, you know, they are just respond to what we are experiencing. And men, they are not like, they don't, they don't have this habit or whatever, you know, uh, lifestyle or whatever to stick something in their butt. And, you know, this is not something 
very nice. So I always tell my patient, even they say, okay, so listen, we have plan A and plan B. Plan A, we'll do whatever we do, we'll not go there. And we try to see if we can manage that. And then we have the plan B. If we cannot, we find you really need that part we're going to do it. So people like it, you know, <laughs> options so, are good. Options are good. And yes, that, you, you no, always provide. What was that Woody? Yeah. Yeah. And then you always provide and based on what they want, right. You say there are two options, right? Right. <laughs> right. And not that putting anything in one's butt is a bad thing at all or having yeah. preferences is, 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 um, negative in any means, but uh, we're yeah. mostly talking about, you know, th those that identify as heterosexual. And uh, even, even, in, even then, you know, there are some individuals who just don't appreciate anything up their bum. And I think, you know, we often as physios forget because we're so trained to, oh, we have to do internal work. Or we have to do this type of treatment and this isn't our training and that's it. And I like what you're saying, Woody, is like, there's options. It doesn't always have to be one way or no way. There are right. many different paths to feeling well, to reconnecting with your body, your sexuality, uh, your sexual health, to, to feeling more confident and safe in your body. And, and again, you know, because I know you on a, on a more personal level, because we, we work on a mentorship together and we've had classes together. Um, I know that you speak to this with your patients. You're just very human with them and you allow them to be themselves and you yourself are yourself in these, in this therapeutic dynamic. And I feel, and I feel like yeah. that is such a precious gift. Um, to be able to not only receive, but to give um, and, and to just be re real, just be real, be you, allow your, the, the, your, per, your patients to be real, be themselves. And that's where you're going to be able to truly get into um, what they really need um, to, to get right. better, to feel better. So thank you so much for sharing that, Woody. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> so... Um, before we wrap up here, I just, I have, um, a final question or maybe not a question, but maybe something that you'd like to share with the audience. What's one piece of advice that you would like to give to, um, I guess anyone I was thinking men, because we we're talking about men's health and, and, you know, I predominantly work with the male population, but, you know, if you have any words of wisdom or any pieces of advice, um, to people who are listening who might be struggling with sexual dysfunction or pain, or even those practitioners that are working with individuals who are having these challenges, what would you, you know, what would you tell them? Uh, I think my piece, like information is, I think we need to uh, listen to our inside. You know, I think a lot of patients I saw actually already, you know, they all have a busy life or whatever. They don't listen to their body. So we all have to lis listen to our need, you know. When there's something, I mean, is, is a, you know, concerns us, let's see someone and we can rely on. And there are us, you know, the health, public health professionals who are here to help, you know, we offer our, you know, expertise and also our experience. Experience is a mutual share. You know, we are here to help. So, um, you know, just if you have the chance, you have if uh, the audience, if you, you know, you know someone who has this suffering. You know, they are, you know, at the moment they don't know where to look for. We are here as health professionals to help you, and I think that's. So powerful. As soon as you enter, you talk to someone and there you know someone we can listen to you and such a big relief most of the time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Beautifully said. Thank you so much, Woody. Thank you so much for being on the show. How can listeners, if they wanted to reach out to you or work with you or consult with you, what's the best way to connect? Uh, I think like uh, uh, I can give you my email address. You can put, uh, you know, in the introduction. And also if, you know, people sometimes cannot find me, they can find you, you know, and uh, we can connect 
<laughs> That's right. I would be happy to. Absolutely. Yes. I will definitely put your email in the show notes. And so for those listening and who want to connect with Woody, um, you'll have his contact information there. So thank you to Woody again for being here on the show and sharing such a beautiful words of wisdom and your experiences um, clinically and personally. We so appreciate all the work that you are doing to advance um, health and sexual health, um, particularly and pelvic physiotherapy um, for both men and women because we definitely need more options and we need um, more men who are doing this work as well. So thank you so much um, from the bottom of my heart, Woody. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I, <laughs> you know, I enjoyed every conversation with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm humbled. And to all our listeners out there and those who are watching on YouTube, thank you so much for your support. Um, until next time, my friends, in loving wellness for your pelvis, this is Dr. Susie G. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Be sure to head on over to drsusieg.com where you can get more information, show notes, and related articles on today's topic. Also, if you like what you're hearing, head on over to iTunes, subscribe to the podcast, and leave us a rating and review. We'd love to hear your feedback. Thanks again.